If we can get your attention, we've got the third talk for the morning session uh, with Georgios. Thank you, and <clears throat> thank you all for coming here today, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, so I would like to talk to you about preparing states on quantum devices, and precisely it will be about preparing matrix product states, which is nothing else than area law, entanglement area law states in one dimension. So what do I mean by state preparation? So this is the task where you would like to create a state on quantum hardware given that you know the classical description of it. So more precisely, this is the algorithm where you input the description and you get as output the sequence of elementary operation that the device needs to apply to produce the desired state. And elementary operations for this talk will be quantum gates and as we will see later also quantum measurements. So why is this useful? Why would you want to create a state on a quantum device that you already know? So first of all, on, in quantum computing, there are many algorithms that require ancilla qubits that uh, need to be prepared in some certain state. Uh, for instance, there are also uh, uh, variational algorithms finding ground states. You need to prepare states you already know. In error correction, we need to prepare states to store information. Another special task is quantum simulation, where you want to understand the dynamics of uh, some process. And the key subroutine here is to create some interesting relevant initial state. But from a more fundamental perspective, one would like to know the complexity. So given a state, what is the minimum number of gates that is possible to, to create that? However, this is a very general question. And from a many body uh, perspective is also uh, not so useful to talk in general about all states because there are exponentially many states. So the point here is to adopt a relevant class and make progress on, on this front. And for me, the guiding principle to pick a class will be very practical for this talk. So if we think about uh, existing devices, we know these devices are noisy. So the evolution times that are relevant are short. And also in many instances, the platforms have locality constraints. So as I will show now, this leads very naturally in one dimension to matrix product states. So why is that? We know that short evolution times can be well approximated by shallow circuits. And these circuits, if they have geometric locality, which I'm assuming here, have two very strong uh, fundamental restrictions. So one of them comes from entanglement. That entanglement is very limited, which means if you make a cut of your system, then the entanglement entropy grows at most proportionally to the depth. However, there is also a second very important fact that comes from locality, which is the so-called strict light cone. And by that, I mean that if you pick a subset, let's say here you pick the, these middle qubits, then every layer can only create correlations to the nearest neighbors. And this leads to the following, that if you take the reduced state on two parts, A and B, which are far away, more than twice the depth, the state that comes out is just factor. Great. So now uh, these are relevant states for sure, but there are other states with low entanglement that are relevant. For instance, we all know about GHZ states and topological states. These have low entanglement, but they're very different because they have long range correlations. And on the other hand, from a many body perspective in one dimension, we talk about local Hamiltonians that are gapped and we all know the ground states have uh, weak correlations, but still they don't satisfy the strict light cone. So putting all this together, it is relevant to look at, uh, in 1D, to look at states that satisfy an entanglement area law, which if you're familiar, it just means uh, they're tensor network states known as matrix product state. If you don't know this fact, don't worry, you can think of matrix product states just as area law states. But more technically, these are defined from tripartite tensors that one uh, contracts appropriately. And the key property is that the entanglement entropy that comes out satisfies a strict area law and vice versa. Every 1D area law state can be written in this form. Okay, very good. So now we have picked our uh, class of states which I claim are relevant. And these are the questions I want to ask and uh, hopefully answer in this talk. So first of all, I want to know what are the fundamental limits on preparing matrix product states, here abbreviated as, as MPS. And I will show you the key unknown uh, component here is how to prepare optimally short range entangled states, which I will define in a, in a second. Uh, 
And uh, the question is, one specifies here that the tensors would specify the state, and I want to know what is the optimal depth, the exact lower n upper bound that prepares this class of states, and I'm claiming for short range and tangled, this is exactly logarithmic. So I'll explain this in a second. And the second part that I want to, to, to touch on this talk is can we break this bound with some reasonable resources? And then I will claim that if you allow measurements and feedback, which is something very reasonable for near-term devices and also in entanglement theory, we know about LOCC. So if you allow measurements, in fact, you can break this bound and get uh, the following that you can prepare every MPS short or long range in depth, which is doubly logarithmic in the system size. So that's, that's very fast. Great. So let's start. What is known about preparing matrix product states? So it will be relevant to distinguish between two classes. The first one is long range entangled. Uh, the technical term for this is non-injective, but don't worry about this if you don't know it. The key point here is that a standard representative for this class is the GHZ state. And we all know this state has correlations at every distance. So that's why it's long range. On the other hand, there are short range correlated states. Standard examples would be the cluster state or the AKLT state. And these have at most exponentially decaying correlations. However, notice, which will be useful for later, that Cluster state has a strict light cone, comes from a finite depth circuit, while the AKLT does not have actually exponentially decaying correlations. OK, so I distinguish between these two classes. So what about their preparation? For long range entangled, the top part, it is known since mid-2000s that you can prepare all of them with linear depth. And not only this, this is in fact optimal. You cannot do better, and that's very trivial to get is because correlations are at all distances, all constituents need to talk to each other. So now I will talk about the short range part, which was missing. And uh, the claim again is that this class of states can be pre prepared with logarithmic depth and that this is optimal. So let me first talk about the optimality part. What is the idea to get the lower bound? So the, the claim more precisely will be that if you give me any matrix product state, which has truly exponentially decaying correlations, this means the correlation length is non-zero, but finite, then you will not be able to prepare the state by a local quantum circuit at a constant depth. You really need depth that grows with the system size. And that's maybe counterintuitive at first sight, because we know that uh, this is a state that has strict area law, so constant depth can produce the correct entanglement. So it's not the entanglement that is missing here, it's something else. And this has to do with correlations again. So we know that uh, th these short range entangled states have exponential decaying correlations. So that's schematically shown here. But on the other hand, as I said at the beginning, any finite depth circuit has correlations which are cut after some distance. And now you can uh, use this idea to actually show rigorously that this leads in a mismatch uh, between the target state if you restrict to finite depth. And it turns out you get a lower bound which is logarithmic by this idea. Okay, I don't want to give you more details on this. This is that's the rough sketch of what's going on. But how do you actually now produce, how do you prepare this sort of range entangled states? So the uh, input here, again, is the description of the state in terms of the tensors. And uh, this short range entanglement, this tensor have a property called injectivity. Now, the result is the following in more detail. Uh, so is an approximate preparation, but the approximation epsilon is in the fidelity, is the infidelity is the error epsilon. And this will see go goes to zero in the thermodynamic limit. So the bigger the state, the better the preparation. And the depth of uh, this preparation process will be logarithmic in the system size. So how does this look like? There are two steps. So you want to create the state phi, which is this good approximation. The first step is to create uh, this backbone state, if you want, this carries the correlations at the largest distance scale. So what you do is you cut your system in chunks of logarithmic size, and you distribute entangled states that uh, you know are far apart in this logarithmic distance. And this can be done with a local circuit, just with logarithmic depth. So that's OK, even with local gates. And the second part is you do this staircase type circuits, but now not globally, but on each chunk 
which is parallelizable. And it and turns out there's a choice of this staircase that uh, leads exactly to the claim above. So it leads to a good approximation in the thermodynamic limit, just with logarithmic depth overall. Okay, very good. So this concludes the short range entangled part. So I have given you a lower bound and an upper bound. So that concludes the complexity for this class. And the complexity for the long range case was already known. It was uh, just linear. So now what remains? Uh, it remains to talk about the measurement part. So now we'll claim if you include something extra, and this extra will be uh, on top of shallow circuits to add measurements, these measurements can enhance the power, namely cut down the necessary depth. And I will show you two variants to do this. So the first variant will be having logarithmic depth and one round of measurements, which sounds like what I had before, but in fact is different because I will uh, now not restrict myself to short range and tangled state, but it turns out that suffices to produce any matrix product state. So any area loss uh, state in one dimension. And then there is even even stronger result, which is adding more rounds of measurements. You can uh, cut the runtime to be double logger in the system size. So that's exponentially better. And the price to pay is do more rounds of measurements. Just to clarify here, depth uh, in the second case uh, refers to not only the depth of the circuit, but also the depth of the measurement in the sense that parallelizable layers of measurements are also taken into account. Okay, and two uh, comments here. So the first one is, I do not assume post-selection here. The preparation, even though there are measurements, is deterministic. And the second one is that uh, this uh, result is an exponential improvement to what was uh, the strongest result before, at least to my knowledge, uh, which was using also measurements. Okay, so let me show you how uh, these two variants are done. So like before, you start by specifying the state. Now there is no restriction except that it is translation invariant. I will deal with uh, breaking this assumption later. But for now, assume the state is translation invariant. You define the tensor. Now you have a sequence of states for all system sizes, and you want to prepare it. So what do you do? Let me show you the first variant, which has one round of measurements and is more relevant to near-term devices just because measurements are like, hard to implement, but still doable. So how do you do that? Uh, you start once again with a state at the beginning, but this state now is more complicated. It has correlation at all distances, uh, and essentially it resembles a GAG type state. So the, the exact form is shown on the bottom right, but don't worry about it. So morally, this is some kind of GAG state. And the key point here is to do this state in constant depth, uh, you need measurements, and that can be done. So I won't show you the details, but feel free to ask me later if you wish. And the second part, which is to fill in the local details, the local correlations on each chunk, which is again logarithmic, is identical as before. So you do this staircase, which takes logarithmic depth. And in total, if you put it together, the bottom part has constant depth and is the logarithmic part comes just from the local details from this staircase circuit. Okay, good. Uh, now this brings me to the strongest algorithm, the one with the better asymptotic scaling with the double logarithm. How do you do this? So now the initial state at the bottom is again the same, it's some GAG type state. And uh, what changes now is how you fill in the local unitary, so this local entanglement. And it turns out you can express this as a tree scheme. And now we know the depth of the tree is logarithmic, but it's logarithmic in the chunk and the chunk was already logarithmic. So that's how you get the double logarithm. And the, the gates that appear here, they look like big gates, but in fact, there are not many body gates, they're just constant gates just at large distances. And the second key point here is that you can implement that by using teleportation. So that's why now you need more rounds of measurements because you need to implement these long range gates. And it turns out you can do the counting carefully and you end up with a double logarithm in the system size. And the error analysis is identical as in the previous protocol. So the bigger the system size, the error goes to zero. <laughs> 
Good. Okay. So let me uh, put this in more context. So what is left out here? So if we're interested in one dimension null states with an area law, so the first obvious thing that I left out is inhomogeneous states, meaning I was assuming translation invariance. And this is something which is very natural in this context, but maybe in practical applications, you want to prepare states which don't look uh, translation invariant. And it turns out that's not a problem because uh, typical random states uh, have been studied before, and it turns out the correlation length for these states is very, very short. So using uh, these ideas, it turns out that uh, typical inhomogeneous states are short range correlated. And the first algorithm I showed you with the logarithmic depth without measurements works in practice pretty much perfectly. So it works with the same error analysis. Okay, that's one part. And the second part is slightly more technical, but it turns out, even though I was talking about translation invariant states, there is a specific class of states that was left out, cannot be uh, incorporated. And this is the so-called W and Dicky states. So here I, I quote the W state. So this is one excitation at every position. This excitation is the one you see. And this is translation invariant by construction, but it turns out that for a technical reason, if you want to write this as a tensor network, you need to put open boundary conditions and that somehow brings problems to us. So we need to treat this case separately and uh, this can be done. So that closes this loophole of ignoring W states, but with a different algorithm. And that was first done by the group of Harry Berman. And it turns out that it can be done in constant depth with measurements and logarithmic ancillas in the system size. But later we showed uh, that one can allow for approximate preparations and uh, have all the resources be independent of the system size. So this closes uh, this class of states, it resolves uh, you know, this class of states that were not included before. So now essentially everything in 1D with area law is, is included. Okay, so that brings me to my last slide. So I would like to put my work in more perspective and more context. So what I have shown you, first of all, is that uh, logarithmic depth uh, suffices to do short range entangled states. And uh, it turns out that concludes the circuit complexity. So it's both a lower bound and an upper bound uh, for this class of states. And uh, for long range entangled states, which is the other possibility, uh, it is known that the optimal complexity is linear. So that uh, resolves the complexity in general for matrix product states, the circuit complexity. Then I showed you that you can do better just by adding another resource, which is quantum measurements and subsequent feed forward. And this leads in a strong speed up, which is doubly exponential in the system size. So you go from linear, which was necessary to do GHZ states, for example, to double logarithm. Good. So uh, how else can you interpret these results Okay, here I adopted the perspective of quantum state preparation, but there, is, there are other ways to think about this. So one way is to adopt the resource theory perspective. And uh, if you have background in quantum information theory, you know about local operations and classical communications. So another way to see these results is from this uh, lens, because what we're doing here is state transformation from an initial trivial product state to our target matrix product state. And uh, here we don't work in a low CC, of course, because there are shallow circuits, but uh, that's exactly the point. So the point is low CC is hard to do in a many body setting, but allowing for short depth circuits, one can really understand uh, much better what states are achievable. So uh, in conclusion, there's a second way to view this from a resource theory, which puts together low CC and shallow circuits. Um, there are more implications of this approach of using measurements. So there was quite a bit of work in two dimensions because in 2D, we know there are true topological states. So in 1D, we have only GHZ states. And uh, uh, what is interesting here is by including measurements, you can actually prepare in constant time states which are topological, which is otherwise forbidden 
And uh, this also opens the, the avenue to include symmetries, which from a many body perspective is very natural. And uh, in this work that I quote, uh, we define a framework that puts into account measurements, uh, uh, includes measurement and symmetries together and generalizes the so-called SPT phases, symmetry protected topological phases. And finally, uh, I want to point out that this is not only a theoretical idea to incorporate measurements, but there are also many experimental implementations along this direction. And with that, I would like to thank you. Okay, questions? Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I'm wondering if you have a conjecture for the, for the lower bound with measurements. That's a very good question. I don't have a sharp answer to it. So maybe what I can say is, we, like motivated by this, we're trying to, uh, to see if everything can be done in constant depth. And we came up with some algorithm, but it turns out this algorithm works for a subclass of states. So in the end, it, we couldn't push it to constant depth, but I also don't have an argument why this lower bound would be tight. So I, I don't really know. It's a Thanks. good point. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, you mentioned for the case like the matrix product state with open boundary, you need a different algorithm. And uh, so I'm wondering like the, the exactly like the for dependence of the parameters uh, for the open boundary case or the usual boundary case, there are some difference. I'm asking because um, there's another like a computer science task. It's like given quantum state testing either is a matrix product state. Uh, for their result, uh, they, something called, uh, I think a number of samples, they call that like a uh, copy complexity. Uh, this thing is like the depends and really, I think they have like kind of a uh, quadratic difference for this depends on either it's a closed boundary or open boundary. So yeah, maybe you can see a bit more about like open boundary and closed boundary difference in also in your setting, like preparing the uh, MPS. Okay, so let me put some more details. So why does one need to treat this W and Dicky states separately? So it turns out there's a subtle point between differentiating physical state being translation invariant and requiring that the state can be represented by one tensor which is repeated at all sizes. It turns out these two notions are different. So if you have one tensor repeated at all sizes, you get translation invariance with periodic boundary. Okay. But now if you ask, can I write in this form any translation invariant state with an area law? It turns mm -hmm. out the answer is no. And the exception is exactly these D key and W states. So that's yeah. exhaustive. And so that's the first point. So even though having translation invariance on the physical, uh, you know, in the physical uh, Hilbert space doesn't mean there is a tensor network representation the way we want it. Uh -huh. So that's the first part. And the second part is that now what is going on here is some kind of renormalization if you want in a physics language. So you block in, in parts and then you want by discarding local degrees of freedom to get something simple in the large scale. And it turns out these Dicky states and these W states for this physical reason fail to renormalize. So if you try to renormalize the W state, you still get some kind of W state. So you don't solve the problem. While in what we're doing here, you actually solve the problem. By renormalizing, you end up with very simple states which you can produce. Okay, so basically you are saying um, like there are two notions of translation invariance depends on the boundary condition. And also um, there are some issue about normalization. Indeed. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering the uh, 2005 Sean and Restrada paper, the complexities are given in the number of sites, like you have them, and also the bond dimension. And I did not see the bond dimension appear anywhere in your talk. And so I'm wondering how the complexity goes with that. Okay, that's a good question. So here, the goal was to fix the bond dimension and uh, then grow the system size. So. To begin with, one needs to specify what class of states you're looking at. And the most natural from a tensor network perspective is to fix the tensor with some bond dimension which is fixed and then repeat it arbitrarily many times and that gives you a class of states which for all system sizes you get a state and then you look um, what is the complexity of this state. So if I understood correctly, what you have in mind is some kind of sequence of states where the bond dimension grows. Is this, is this correct? 
Yeah, yeah. Like but, I think most uh, condensed matter simulations, you would tune increase the bond dimension to increase the accuracy of the variational state. And so if that's being left off of this complexity, that's like a huge missing component, right? Well, if you allow the bond dimension to grow arbitrarily, of course, you recover the full Hilbert space. I mean, you know this, but I guess you're asking in this algorithm, where is the bond dimension in the complexity? Yes. Okay. So the bond dimension is exponential and that's true. So if you increase the bond dimension, uh, then, uh, yeah, then the cost increases exponentially. That's true. But in the bond dimension, not in the system size. Does this answer? So then, no, there, there are two components, the system size and the bond dimension. Bond dimension is exponential, system size is the way I showed it. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.